Hi guys, glad to see you again uh, in this lecture series. And uh, today we are going to continue our discussion on uh, the swaps contracts. Um, as you might have uh, watched the previous uh, series on the swaps contracts or the fifth part of the derivative, derivative lecture series, swaps is essentially an exchange of uh, obligations. Um, for example, between the fixed rate and floating rate securities or debt or uh, any kind of uh, other situations that we are going to uh, we're going to see today. Okay, so uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so um, again, we see there are a lot of types of swaps contracts that we, uh, I think you have also watched on the uh, previous session. Um, it was like pure interest rate swap, and then we have a pure currency swap, and we have the combination between the interest rate and also the currency swap. So uh, for, for Today's uh, discussion um, will focus more on how the SWEPS contracts are harnessed or utilized um, in a risk management setting uh, to hedge you know, uh, a financial institution's risk. That's why we're going to see you know, interest rate, currency, and also the credit, credit swaps or credit default swaps. So swaps markets uh, and the swaps contracts are quite different from other types of derivatives like uh, options or forward or futures because um, swaps contracts are essentially a portfolio of successive forward contracts. So you can imagine, right? You can imagine uh, a portfolio of forward contracts. So it's like a series of forward contracts that we are doing uh, that is actually equivalent to the swaps contracts because we are uh, essentially we are exchanging uh, we are exchanging the um, special obligations maybe the interest payment of a certain debt or something like that and uh, another unique feature of the swaps contract a swaps contract is that uh, it is marked to market at coupon payment dates a like coupon payment that so it's like interest uh, payment dates and have to do the mark to market mechanism. And what is the mark, mark to market or marking to market mechanism again? Uh, it means we like, revalue or reassess the uh, market value, value position of a derivative contract. Uh, maybe you do it every afternoon, we do it every uh, morning or something like that. So uh, I've talked about this also uh, uh, during the forward futures discussion on another uh, uh, lecture series, another YouTube uh, video. So you can, uh, again, review again the, the concept of the marking or mark to market mechanism there. And um, intermediary should reduce counterparty risk. This is, I think, another unique feature of the swap contract because um, now, as an intermediary, like a um, financial institution that buys or sells uh, a swaps contract, we have to be a bit more vigilant because uh, your inter your uh, your counterparty, uh, your client, might go into problem. Right? Uh, they might decline in terms of um, their credit worthiness. Right? So. As an intermediary, as a financial institution that buys or buys or sells the swaps contract, um, now you are faced with the credit risk as well as other types of risk. So um, I think this will be you know, the situation is more dynamic, more uh, complicated than maybe other uh, types of you know contracts. So again, uh, as an intermediate, we see an example here, AIG, uh, during the 2008 to 2010 
crisis, the banking crisis in the United States, we know that the AIG uh, was getting into big trouble. And of course, they had a lot of trouble because they, they had, uh, they sold a lot of you know, credit default swaps to the market. And uh, nobody really expected that the crisis would happen. And they had to you know, uh, pay a lot of money and finally were unable to uh, fulfill their obligation to their clients uh, because of the, uh, uh, the credit crisis at the time. Okay, so <clears throat> we'll repeat a bit uh, something that we have seen actually on uh, the other YouTube video, uh, the previous part. This is about interest rate swaps. And you know, interest rate swap is again, is equivalent to a succession of uh, forward contracts. So we have uh, the uh, common practice in the swaps market. We say that uh, the buyer of the swap, swap, and swap buyer, uh, is the entity that agrees to pay fixed rate obligation. So if uh, if entity A is willing to pay fixed rate obligation, then entity A is considered the swap buyer. And on the other hand, we have swap seller here. Uh, swap seller is, is uh, the other entity or the counterparty that agrees to pay the floating rate obligation. So this is just like a, a, a consensus or a common practice in the market. Right? So we call it yeah, the swap buyer is the one that agrees to pay the fixed rate obligation and vice versa. Uh, the one that agrees to pay the floating rate obligation is called the swap seller. So what is the purpose of the interest rate swap? So this is quite uh, easy to imagine. Um, one party may, may like to pay a uh, fixed rate obligation. However, maybe the, uh, for, uh, for a certain reason, this entity is right now paying uh, the floating rate obligation, so it doesn't like it. Right? So it's paying the floating rate obligation, but actually it likes to pay the fixed rate obligation. Now, on the other hand, we have another entity or other entities that have like different interests. So, uh, for example, another entity uh, is currently paying the fixed rate obligation, but actually it doesn't really like, it's willing to pay the floating rate obligation. So. Um, these two businesses have like different interests, but they are trapped in a uh, in 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 you know the situation at both ways, where uh, they don't really like what they are paying right now. I mean the uh, the rate or the uh, the system that they are paying right now. So there's a chance that they could actually swap. Uh, they could exchange their their obligations because so uh, actually. Uh, one of the uh, no, the entity A likes the way the entity B is paying right now, and and uh, vice versa. So uh, we maybe both parties want to convert the uh, variable rate and also the fixed rate payments into one another. So uh, they could finally. What's the what's the main purpose here? Of course, uh, the main purpose, main objective would be to match the duration of assets and that of liabilities in a certain company. So we'll look at an example here, um, quite simple example, but straightforward. This is a pure uh, interest rate swaps contract example. See on the asset side, uh, the asset side, this company here, Money Center Bank. The Money Center Bank is a uh, uh, lending like, in total $100 million uh, and the return, return is indexed to LIBOR. Right? So this is obviously a floating rate return, right? floating rate return, so variable, variable rate return. Uh, however, if we see the uh, financing side, actually uh, this money center bank, um, you know, is financed using the medium term notes. So this is like fixed rate obligation, fixed rate debt or liability uh, of $100 million. So you see there's a uh, 
<coughs> uh, we don't call it mismatch, but maybe like um, discrepancy right, between the payment system. Uh, on the asset side, they they will get the return uh, in the form of the floating rate, you know, floating rate uh, return, right, variable rate return. But on the other hand, on the financing side, on the liability side, they have to pay the fixed rate obligation. But on the other hand, we see uh, panel B here, another bank, the savings bank. Uh, this is, I think, the opposite situation. Um, the savings bank is lending out like $100 million as fixed rate mortgages. So it's fixed rate mortgages. So uh, it will receive like fixed fixed rate return right, from from these assets, from these loans. Uh, on the other, but on the other uh, on the other hand here, the financing side, uh, they have to finance their uh, operations using a short term CDs, right? Short term uh, certificate of deposits of one hundred million. So this is the variable rate, right? floating rate, floating rate CDs, and the duration is uh, the maturity is one year. So <clears throat> we see uh, a, a simple situation here. Money Central Bank actually. Uh, wants because, because it has its liabilities in uh, the fixed rate obligation, fixed rate liabilities. Actually, the money center bank is more interested in paying uh, the variable rate. Be why? Because on the asset side, um, the money center bank right now is is expecting or or, or enjoying a, a rate of return. In the fair in the in the variable or the floating uh, system, floating rate system. So naturally, money center bank also wants to uh, pay its obligations or liabilities in the floating rate system, right? Floating rate uh, type of uh, liabilities. But on the other hand, here savings banks, because uh, it's expecting or enjoying return in. The, uh, from the fixed rate mortgages. So naturally savings banks uh, in this example uh, will be will be more willing, will be more interested in uh, paying the fixed rate system, uh, fixed rate uh, liabilities. So uh, this being the case, actually money center bank and the savings bank would uh, make, make an exchange or uh, be involved in the swaps, in the swaps contract. Okay, so we see the situation again. So this is the situation to the uh, money center bank. Is the uh, they have uh, assets or loans in uh, or making variable rate return, but right now they are paying uh, fixed rate obligation or liability, so they don't like it. Uh, if possible, they want to they want to shift or they want to uh, swap this obligation with you know, another bank or another entity uh, by which they could actually pay the floating rate or variable rate obligation, and vice versa with the savings bank. So um, let's see an example right now. If uh, they could. They could make a contract. They could make an agreement here. Um, let's say the yeah. notional value of the swaps is hundred million. So this is, I think, the uh, the simplification of the, the situation you see here. Uh, by chance, you know, the notional value notional value of of uh, or notional values of their uh, balance sheet balance sheets are the same. Right? Both have like one hundred million. Uh, on the asset side, but also liability side. But of course, in reality, we we can't find you know, something uh, that really matches you know, uh, from uh, the two perspective or two points of view. So, um, if this is not um, equal, then they have to figure out you know the amount of money that they could they could make a contract on. Maybe they could only make a fifty million uh, a fifty million dollar contract or yeah, something like that. So, uh, it, in in the real life, it may it may not be possible to have you know like 
this kind of perfectly matched uh, notional value right, between the two entities. But here, uh, for the sake of you know, brevity and the ease of analysis, we assume that the notional value of the swap will be 100 million. So both parties or both entities agree with it. And the maturity is four years. So the, the uh, maturity of the, the swap is four years with 10% fixed payments. So this is what they agree on. And the for the for the variable side, the floating rate side, uh, the rate is LIBOR plus 2%. And LIBOR is again the London Interbank Offered Rate. So London Interbank Offered Rate. So this is like Interbank, uh, interbank Interest Rate of the US dollar denominated uh, deposits in London. So LIBOR plus two, that's the variable rate. And I think we have seen from the logic before the Money Center Bank, uh, right now they are paying the fixed rate, uh, fixed rate liabilities. They don't like it because their assets are uh, making money or making return in floating or variable system. So they would be happier, they would be more willing to pay <clears throat> the uh, floating rate liability. So uh, on the other hand, Savings Bank here, Savings Bank right now they are paying the uh, CD rate or variable rate, but actually they would be happier if they could, they could pay uh, fixed rate obligations because their assets are fixed rate mortgages or making money uh, with the fixed rate uh, uh, system, a uh, fixed rate mortgage. So, uh, okay, major situation. Uh, this is quite similar to what, what I explained in the previous video. Now, uh, they have to pay the uh, fixed rate, but they uh, shift it to the savings bank, I mean, the money center bank. Of course, they have to fulfill their, their, their obligation right now. They have to pay the fixed rate system, but they will ask the savings bank to fulfill this obligation. So, see here, uh, the fixed rate payment would be made from, uh, would be made by uh, the savings bank to the money center bank. So again, the money center bank, they don't like the fixed rate uh, liabilities, but right now they are having it. So uh, they have to uh, fulfill uh, their obligation right, by paying the fixed rate uh, liabilities, but they uh, swap it, right? they swap it. So they ask the savings bank to fulfill this obligation. But on the other hand here, um, the savings bank, right now they are paying the uh, variable rate obligation, right? the uh, CD rate, they don't like it. So they shift it to the money center bank. So they ask money center bank to fulfill this obligation. That's why the money center bank uh, will, will remit, I will pay LIBOR plus 2% to the savings bank. So you see here, there's a swap, uh, swap situation, a swap contract between the money center bank and the savings bank. So uh, what was happening here? So, uh, I can show it here. Imagine the money center bank. So money center bank, again, um, right now they are paying a 10%, right? 10% of uh, the liabilities, right? 10% on the liabilities. Uh, they don't like it, of course. They don't like the fixed rate payment, fixed rate uh, liabilities, but right now they're having it. But through the swap contract, uh, this is a savings bank. So the money center bank will ask the uh, savings bank to pay the fixed obligation because they like it, right? The savings bank likes the uh, fixed rate liability. So, so it will be paid by the savings bank. So consequently, money center bank will receive the payment from the savings bank. On the other hand, um, again, we uh, saw from the example, the, the savings bank is currently paying LIBOR plus two, LIBOR plus 2%. And of course,
course, they don't like it. Right? They don't like the variable rate payment because you know they're they're making money uh, in the form of you know, fixed rate mortgages, right? Fixed rate uh, interest return or interest income. So they don't like this one. So they ask MCB to uh, pay for it. So, And consequently, the savings bank will receive uh, LIBOR plus two. Okay, so if we total that, we find that you no, know, this uh, these two cancel out one another, and uh, money center bank ends up paying LIBOR plus two percent, right? And here, uh, the savings bank ends up paying about 10%. However, we should uh, remember from, uh, from the example that actually they don't pay, I mean, the uh, savings bank, savings bank doesn't really pay LIBOR plus 2%. So actually they are paying the CD rate, right? So there's a, a I think, a, a, a basis risk here because the savings bank uh, is, is paying the CD rate. Right? So, uh, but of course, in, in reality, we know that the uh, the gap or, or the spread between LIBOR and uh, the CD rate would be quite, quite stable from time to time. Uh, they may not be, no, no, the spread may not remain the same forever, but we could, uh, we could say that more or less, uh, uh, is quite stable right, from time to time. So let me do it more uh, realistically now. So they, they are going to pay the CD rate. Right, the CD rate. <clears throat> but uh, when when money uh, when savings bank swaps uh, the CD rate obligation with the money center bank. The money center bank is willing to pay LIBOR plus two, and again we know that the uh, uh, the spread between the LIBOR and the CD rate would be quite quite stable right, from time to time, maybe about yeah about the uh, same spread, maybe two percent or three percent uh, from time to time. So uh, here, what do we end up here? We have minus ten. Uh, we have minus ten here. But we have uh, here we have two. We have minus CD. Right? We have minus CD, uh, but we have uh, two percent. Right? We have two percent here. This plus, right? and then we have uh, we have the uh, LIBOR right? and we have the minus CD. So let's go here. Okay, so we end up having, again, we have uh, minus 10, we have plus 2, so it that makes uh, minus 8, right, minus 8, and then we have the minus CD, right, minus CD, again, we have minus outside here, oh, maybe I'll be back here, so let me write it correctly, so we have, uh, again, minus 10 and plus two, we have eight minus 8%. Eight we have minus CD, minus CD rate, and we have the positive LIBOR, plus LIBOR. Okay, so uh, if you want to make into one, uh, uh, one formula or one, uh, what's it? Uh, Calculation within within brackets within parentheses, so we can do it this way. This would be this right. So eight percent, and then uh, again this is minus so plus CD CD rate and minus LIBOR. You can see right. This is minus. Uh, 
and the CD is minus also, and the LIBOR is plus. Okay, so, um, yeah. So the money center bank ends up paying the variable rate, something that they 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 do like actually right, in this example, and on the other hand, the savings bank ends up paying the uh, relatively fixed rate, right? Because again, uh, the spread between uh, the CD rate and LIBOR, LIBOR rate um, is usually like quite stable, right? not necessarily constant, but quite stable from time to time. So let's say this, this is quite stable at maybe 2%. So you could imagine this would be about 10, 10%. And uh, from the story we follow that uh, if money center bank has to, has to borrow uh, the variable rate liabilities by, by themselves, then they have to pay LIBOR plus two and a half. So there's a, uh, uh, there's a saving here, I, uh, uh, efficiency here because they ends up paying LIBOR plus two. Uh, uh, whereas if they borrow the uh, variable rate, floating rate liabilities by, by, by the, the money center bank themselves, they, they'll have to pay LIBOR plus two and a half. And so there's a, an efficiency of uh, about 0.5% 0, 0 from there. Now, on the other hand here, uh, the story well, the story tells us that uh, if the savings bank has to borrow the fixed rate obligation, fixed rate liabilities by themselves, they will have to pay like 12%. Um, but here they, they, they end up paying 8% plus the spread between the CD rate and LIBOR. And, and again, we know that the spread between CD rate and LIBOR is usually quite stable from, uh, from time to time. So let's say the uh, spread is 2% or even 3%. They still end up paying like ten percent or eleven percent fixed, relatively fixed, from time to time. Uh, so there is again there is an efficiency. There's a saving from uh, this the swap contract. So uh, let's imagine that the uh, labor from year to year, from one year to another. Here, uh, the first year is eleven percent. <clears throat> so remember that the money center bank has to pay LIBOR plus two. So they, they have to pay like 11%, right? 11% 11 of uh, 100 million is 11 million. And the second year, same thing here. The third year, uh, LIBOR has uh, declined to 7%. So seven plus two is 9%, okay? So the LIBOR has declined in the third year to 7%. Seven plus two is nine. Nine of one hundred million is like nine million dollars, and in the fourth year, LIBOR has further declined to six percent. So six plus two is eight. On the other on the other hand, here um, we see that savings bank uh, relatively pays the uh, fixed rate because again, the spread between the spread between uh, the CD rate and the LIBOR is quite stable from time to time. Let's say two percent. Okay. So eight plus two is ten. So they, uh, the savings bank will you know, continuously pay around uh, around ten percent per year. So whatever, uh, whatever whatever happens to the LIBOR, that will uh, that will also affect the CD rate. So if the LIBOR uh, goes up a bit, then the CD rate CD rate is expected to go up. At, go up as well, and vice versa. If LIBOR is declining, then the CD rate is expected to decline as well. So here we see that the savings bank ends up paying relatively fixed payment from time to time. And you see here, both entities enjoy what they, they do like, because again, money center banks, they, they like the uh, floating rate payment, and they, they get it by uh, exchanging or swapping with making a swaps contract with savings bank. Now, on the other hand, the savings bank gets what they like as well. So they end, they, they, they end up paying uh, a fixed payment, a fixed rate payment by exchanging or by making a swap contract with the, the money center bank. Okay, um, there are some 
types of uh, of market swaps of market swaps uh, mean that this is done uh, outside the market of market for example swaps can be oh, can be made uh, can be uh, tailor tailor made to suit the needs of like special interest terms special interest terms or varying notional value I think the previous example we just saw that the notional value of the contract was uh, quite quite easy to determine because both entities um, had the like hundred million dollar uh, stake right for both entities so when they uh, make an exchange contract or a swap contract it's, it's quite obvious that the notional value will be hundred million dollars but I think in uh, in reality in many situations uh, notional value would be uh, based on a negotiation or uh, an agreement or some sort of that because both entities are having like different uh, different values at stake so they have to come up to the table with uh, uh, on a negotiation to really determine the notional value that they're going to uh, make a contract on. So uh, what are the special interest terms? Maybe we have uh, one example here, a special case uh, for special interest terms. We have in inverse floater swap, a structured knot. Uh, this is inverse floater swap is part of the structured knot. Structured means we have, uh, again, the, the structure of, of uh, assets or underlying assets. Inverse floater, um, you see, as the name suggests, we see the name inverse here. Inverse means if, uh, for example, here, I, I go directly to the example, the uh, financial institutions, um, let's say they don't, uh, they don't like an increasing library rate, right? the London Interbank Offer Rate, so they don't like the increasing library rate, so, uh, they want to hedge, right? They want to do something uh, that, uh, or if labor rate increases, they'll earn money from this contract. See, for example, here we, we can have a term like this. Right? So the uh, the term is that the financial institution will pay that like seven percent minus the labor rate. And it will receive library rate. So uh, again, why the why does the financial institution want to do this? This shows that the financial institution doesn't like an increasing labor, right? An increasing library rate. So uh, you can imagine if if the library rate right now is uh, let's say two uh, percent, two percent, so seven plus seven minus two is about five. And uh, they will they will get the library rate, but uh, if library rate increases from two to three percent, uh, two to three, so at first they they they'll have to pay that like seven minus two, but because the library rate increases to three percent, now they will have to pay only four percent to the government agency, and government agency will of course will sell it again to to investors. And here see the the, the logic here. If library rate increases, then the financial institution will pay less. That's what we call it inverse floater swap. And on the other hand, they will still receive the LIBOR. Right? They will receive, so they will pay, let's say 4%, they will receive 3%. So why, why do we want to do this again? This is a situation where the financial inst institution doesn't like an increasing LIBOR. So they want to do something uh, so that they will get money, or they will they will enjoy they will enjoy something from the transaction if library rate does increase. But they don't like the increasing library rate, so they want to do something so that if the library rate does increase, they will earn money from this transaction. But on the other hand, uh, you, you can imagine that uh, if library rate actually decreases, then the, the financial institutions will will pay more. Right, because now they have to pay, for example, library rate 
has decreased from 2% to 1%. So at first they are, uh, as of right now, they, they have been paying 7 plus 2 at 5%, but when the library rate decreases to 1%, now they will have to pay 6% instead of 5 So they'll have to pay more. But on the other hand, they will receive uh, LIBOR also from, from the counterparty. So again, we call it inverse floater swap because uh, if the rate is increasing, uh, actually we'll, we'll get more money from that transaction. And again, this is a hedging mechanism uh, that shows that you don't like an increasing rate. That's why we, that's why you uh, get involved in this kind of contract, uh, the inverse floater swap. Okay, next one here. Um, so far, we, we, we saw the uh, micro hedging, micro hedging for every transaction, for every uh, micro transaction or item by item transaction. And we also watched the uh, previous YouTube video uh, that was most likely, uh, the, the, so that was mostly uh, talking about the micro hedging system, but now we are going to see the macro micro hedging with uh, swaps. Here uh, we have. Uh, oh, you still remember from our discussion on the interest rate risk? Uh, we have uh, uh, the what's that? The uh, formula or equation that could estimate the change in equity, the change in equity because of the change in interest rate. And here we, yeah, we see here again. Uh, this is minus the duration of assets minus the duration of liabilities that has been multiplied with the debt ratio. K is the debt ratio. Then you multiply it with the uh, uh, asset size and then with the uh, expected, expected change in interest rate divided by 1 plus the original interest rate. So uh, we want to balance the, uh, the change in the equity value with the change in the swaps value because we go to the swaps uh, market, the swaps contract to make sure that if something happens to the equity value, will uh, uh, will be compensated or we gain back some money from the change in the swaps uh, contract value, and vice versa. If the equity value is increasing, most likely the uh, swaps value will decrease because this is a hedging mechanism, not not speculation. And how to the how to uh, estimate the change in the swaps value is here minus. Uh, this is the duration of the fixed uh, fixed security minus the uh, duration of the uh, floating uh, floating rate securities multiplied by the notional value of the swaps times the. Uh, expected change in interest rate divided by one plus the original interest rate. Okay, so what is, again, what is the uh, change in the swaps value? Here we have the duration of the fixed, the duration of the fixed. So what is the duration of the fixed? This is the duration on, uh, duration of a government bond that has the that has the same maturity and coupon as the fixed rate side of the swap. So, uh, if the swap contract lasts for ten years, then we try to find uh, a government bond with a maturity or whose maturity is also ten years, and then we uh, and, and of course the uh, coupon rates are comparable. So once again, if uh, our swap contract will last for ten years. Then we try to find a government bond uh, whose maturity is also 10 years and a coupon rate is comparable or similar to that of uh, the fixed rate payment. And then we find its duration. So we try to estimate the duration of, again, a government bond whose uh, maturity and coupon rate are similar to those of uh, the fixed rate payment or fixed rate obligation. And what about the uh, uh, floating here? The du this is the duration duration of a government bond that has the same 
duration as the swap payment interval. For example, one year, right? We're talking about one year, so we, we try to find a government bond, uh, a government bond whose uh, recurring payment or whose uh, the whose redetermination of interest rate is one year. So this is like a, a, a floating rate government bond with with the yeah duration of one year. So usually this is one year. Um, this is the uh, typical uh, typical base number for for uh, this analysis. So once again, we see here this is a, a, a D fixed or uh, something that we need to estimate. We need to estimate the duration of a government bond whose maturity and uh, coupon rate are similar to those of uh, the fixed rate payment of of the the swap contract. And here, this is the uh, the duration of a government bond. Uh, you know, whose duration uh, is usually one year or the same as the swap payment interval. So this is usually one year, yeah. And then this is the uh, notional value of of the the swap contract. And of course, this is the expected change in interest rate divided by one plus the original interest rate. Okay, so when we put them together here, uh, so. You know, here the change in equity is a function of again minus duration of uh, assets minus duration of liabilities multiplied by debt ratio times the assets uh, and times the change in interest rate, expected change in interest rate divided by one plus the original interest rate. On the other hand, uh, here this is. Minus uh, the duration of the fixed, and this is the duration of a uh, government bond whose maturity and coupon rate are similar to uh, those of uh, the fixed rate fixed rate payment of the swap contract minus uh, floating. This is usually one year of the floating multiplied by the notion of value of uh, notion of value of the swap and then uh, same thing here expected change in interest rate divided by one plus the original interest rate and we know that uh, the, the principle of this is the principle of uh, uh, the hedging mechanism uh, so if something happens to the equity uh, the value of equity, then we, we try to get compensation from the, uh, the increasing value of the swap contract and vice versa. So it should look like uh, this. Okay, or uh, you can reverse it if we want. So uh, decreasing equity value should be compensated with an increasing uh, value of the swap contract. Okay, so let's put into the formula here. Okay, so uh, we move it there and we got this. And we have it here for the uh, change in the uh, swap value. Okay, so we can uh, we can immediately limit this one. We, uh, I'll use my board. <coughs> Actually, make a big mistake here. This is without minus. Okay, so. So if I uh, if I choose it, choose to do it this way, 
then the minus here. So I'm gonna put minus here, then the minus here will disappear, right? And this is uh, positive. So we want to equate uh, minus delta equity and uh, delta swap value. And we could eliminate this. Because they are the same. So you know, let me write down more properly here. So the again, here is minus duration of liabilities multiplied by the debt ratio times the asset uh, size. And then this, right, uh, should equal yeah, the duration of fixed minus duration of floating. Multiplied by the uh, notion of value. And again, the change in interest rate divided by one plus original interest rate. Okay, so uh, because we, we are going to find this one, at first we could uh, cross on both sides. Right? So this is easily solved by here. And this is minus and minus, so they cancel out one another. We know that uh, it should be duration of assets minus duration of liabilities times the debt ratio times the asset size okay, divided by the duration of fixed minus duration of floating. So it's quite easy right, to uh, find the equation. Okay, so this is the, uh, is that the estimate of the number of notional uh, the amount of notional value that we have to uh, we have to make or we have to contract <clears throat> to solve this uh, uh, that, uh, potential decrease in equity value because of an increasing interest rate so we see an example now uh, the duration of assets is five years duration of liabilities is two years and the debt ratio is 90% and the asset size is $100 million. And here we have uh, the duration of, see here, duration of uh, a 10 year fixed rate T bond with the same coupon and maturity as the fixed rate payment on the swap contract is seven years. So the D fixed, D fixed is seven years. And of course the duration of the floating rate bond that uh, requires annually so the, the recurring uh, change, recurring payment or repricing is every year. So again, uh, typically this is one year, uh, the, the base of uh, analysis. But we can put into uh, our estimate here, estimate of the amount of notional value required to make sure that uh, we could do the Marco hedging well. So we put into the formula again. So five minus three times 90% times uh, 100 million divided by, this is seven seven years. Again, seven years is the uh, duration of a government bond with uh, the maturity of, of 10 years, because 10 years are the uh, uh, contract period of the swap as well. So a uh, uh, duration of a government bond with the maturity of 10 years and uh, coupon rate that is comparable with the uh, fixed rate payment of the swap, so seven years. And then this is one year. So we get uh, a notional value, uh, an estimate of notional value of 38.3 or 38.33 million dollars. So suppose uh, that every, every swap contract uh, is or is size hundred thousand dollars, 
Then the notional value is $38.33 million and the uh, contract size is $100,000. That, uh, uh, that would indicate that we need to make uh, 300, 383 contracts right? because the notional value required is $38.33 million and each contract size is 100000 So uh, we have, we'll have to make uh, 383 contracts. And if you try to uh, put into the perspective here, uh, if the interest rate interest rate increasing by one percent from its original ten percent, then the equity will suffer by two point oh nine million or almost two point one million. So even you do nothing nothing wrong, you done you have done no mistake, but uh, you see that your equity will decline right, because of the increasing interest rate and you have uh, uh, hedged you have done the you have conducted the micro hedging using the uh, swaps contract and uh, with the notional value of 38.33 million you could recover right, if if the interest rate increasing if the interest rate increases by one percent actually that your swap contract value will increase by 2.0 0.09 million. So this is a, a, a straightforward example that that really matches the loss on one side and the uh, the profit on the other side from the derivative contract, which is the uh, swaps contract. So I think it's quite uh, straightforward, quite easy to follow. And the next one, uh, the currency swaps. And actually, this has been explained also in my previous video right, in a slightly different context, but it's also about uh, uh, currency swap. So we see an example here. And this, the previous example that we, we just saw, the previous uh, discussion was about the interest rate swap. So uh, we were interested in exchanging or uh, making the swap contract on the interest rate interest rate uh, obligation because uh, maybe one entity doesn't like uh, the fixed rate payment on the uh, and on the other hand the other party doesn't really like the floating rate floating rate payment or obligation so they could they could uh, exchange their obligations as a pure uh, pure interest rate swap but now we're going to see the currency swap so in the currency swap as the name suggests, you could uh, uh, easily guess that this happens because one entity doesn't like to pay in a certain currency. And on the other hand, the uh, other entity uh, doesn't like to pay in another currency. But the other entity likes to pay in, uh, in the currency that has been, has been uh, being paid by the first entity. So we see an example here, a US bank with fixed rate assets denominated in dollars. Uh, so they have to pay like 10%. Uh, or maybe just look at the uh, graph. This is easier to imagine. So uh, US financial institution is having uh, assets uh, of $80 million. Uh, the assets are making money or making return uh, of 11%, right? expected to be 11%. However, you see, uh, this financial institution, sorry, uh, not in, this way, this financial institution uh, is borrowing money, is getting its financing from the UK pound, right? From, uh, for some reasons, you know, they finance their uh, operations, they finance their assets using UK pound, 50 million uh, pounds. And uh, the, what's it, the obligation of the, 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 the uh, interest rate or liability rate is about 10%. On the other hand, we have a UK financial institutions. So they are making money in the UK and it's expected to be 50 million pounds and they will enjoy like 11%. And this is an easy example. Um, they have no difference in uh, the lending rate between the United States and the UK. 
And uh, but on the other hand, they uh, finance their assets using U.S. dollars, uh, eighty million U.S. dollars. So, uh, and and the uh, interest rate is about ten percent. So you see, the US, U.S. financial institutions they're not they are not keen on paying uh, using U, U, the, the the pound because they are making money in U.S. dollars. So they will be happier uh, to pay in. U.S. dollars as well. On the other hand, um, U.K. financial institutions, they are paying, right now they are paying the U.S. dollars, but they don't like it because they are making money in pound. So they will be, they will be more uh, motivated, they will be happier to pay their obligation in pound as well because they are making money in pound. Okay, so now you see, uh, see a, a circumstance that uh, enables or uh, yeah that, that enables both financial institutions to exchange their obligations so the u.s financial institutions they uh they have assets in u.s dollars but right now they are paying they are paying in pound right? they are paying fixed rate liabilities in pound so they don't like it right? they don't like it so they could shift this shift this obligation to the UK firm. They, they could tell the UK firm, okay, you pay for me, you pay this, you pay this for me. So the UK pound would be happy to pay the uh, fixed rate payment in pound. All right. So both are happy, right? Because the US financial institution is currently is currently paying the uh, its obligation in uh, UK pound. They of course, they don't like it, so they ask the UK financial institution to uh, pay for this one. Right? So the UK uh, financial institution will pay in pound to the US financial institution. But on the other hand, here, uh, UK financial institution, right now, uh, they are paying the fixed rate liabilities in US dollar. They don't like it. They don't like it because they are making money in pound. So they will shift this obligation to the US uh, financial institution. They could ask the U.S. institution to pay for this one. So please pay for my uh, liabilities. And of course, the because it's part of the, the swap contract, the U.S. financial institution will send the uh, fixed rate liabilities in U.S. fixed rate payment in U.S. dollars to the U.K. firm. So both financial institutions are happy. So they they could uh, they could finally get what they want. Right? They see that the U.S. financial institutions. Uh, ends up paying the uh, fixed rate payment in US dollars and the uh, UK financial institution ends up paying uh, fixed rate liability or fixed rate payment in UK pound. You can imagine if we do it again, the uh, flow, the flow analysis here. Uh, at first, uh, financial US the U.S. Uh, bank has to pay in uh, has to pay its fixed rate payment in pound, but they ask or they uh, swap with the U.K. financial institution here. So it, this will be paid by the U.K. bank. So the U.S. bank will get the payment from the U.K. Uh, bank. On the other hand, at first the U.K. bank has to pay in dollar because they don't like it but they ask the u.s institution to pay for it pay for this obligation in dollar and in the end it uh, get uh, from the u.s bank so at the end uh u.s financial institution is paying in u.s dollar and the uk institution is paying in pound so both could save uh, both could uh, uh, get what they want, right? and let's say the story tells us that if uh, if the U.S. financial institution wants to uh, borrow the uh, fixed rate fixed rate liability in U.S. dollar, actually, if they do it by themselves, they will have to pay ten point five. So there's a saving here; they end up paying ten percent. But actually, if they do it, uh, they do it alone. They do it by themselves. They will have to pay ten point five percent. And similarly here. Uh, according to the story, uh, here the UK financial institution end up paying ten percent on 
uh, fixed rate UK uh, uh, liability. If they, they have to do it by themselves, they will have to pay 10.5%. So there's a, a saving or efficiency from the strap contract. So both entities are happy. And uh, uh, again, please watch my uh, previous video on this swaps contract to see a uh, combination like fixed floating currency swaps or the fixed and floating and also uh, fixed floating currency swaps. So it means that we actually have like uh, two types of, you know, uh, hedging here. So we simultaneously hedge the interest rate risk and also the currency currency risk. So we call it combined interest rate and currency swap or circus. I the circus. So uh, I showed an example on that previous video that you could you could uh, review again. So the circus here again we hedge simultaneously hedge the uh, interest rate and currency risks. So this is an example. The UK financial, uh, the US institution, at first they have to pay fixed rate and in pound, uh, fixed rate and in pound. Let's say they don't like it, so they ask the UK uh, bank to pay for it. Okay? So they receive exactly 10% in UK pound from the UK bank. On the other hand, uh, the UK financial institution, right now they have to pay variable rate, they have to, to pay variable rate in uh, US dollar and they don't like it. That's why they ask the US institution to pay for it. So they will receive LIBOR plus two, or variable rate in uh, US dollar from the US bank. So this is what uh, it ends up. The US financial institution ends up paying variable rate, uh, LIBOR plus two, they have to pay LIBOR plus two and in US dollar. Let's say this is what they want. So they currently they, they are paying fixed rate in pound. They don't like it. Actually, they want a variable rate in dollar. And this is what, what they get, exactly what they want. On the other hand, the UK bank, uh, right now they are paying the uh, variable rate in US dollar. They don't like it. Actually, they want fixed rate in pound. And this is what they do get right, from the swap or from the exchange. So they end up paying uh, fixed rate of 10% and this is in UK pound. Okay, so they get what they want. Uh, so compared to what they will have to pay if they do it by themselves, there is uh, efficiency here. As you see here, uh, the US bank and end up paying LIBOR plus two. If they have to do it by themselves, they have to, uh, in the US market, they have to pay LIBOR plus two and a half percent. And the UK bank, they end up paying 10% of the UK uh, borrowing, if they have to do it alone, maybe they have to pay 11%. So there is a, a saving or efficiency from the swap contract. And we could simulate here, of course, uh, if the LIBOR is nine, remember that the US bank has to pay LIBOR plus two. So the US bank will have to pay 11% uh, if the LIBOR is nine and 11% of $80 million is $8.8 .8 million and so forth. So you see uh, next year, LIBOR drops to seven. So the, the LIBOR plus two is nine. So they have to pay 9% of 80 million and, and so on. What about the fixed payment by the UK firm? Uh, they will have to pay 10% all the time right, for the, the, the two of the four years. So 10 of 10% 10 of 50 million right, is 5 million. They'll have to pay 5 million pounds all the time from year one to four, from years one to four. And assuming that the exchange rate remains at 160 per pound, then uh, that approximately converts to $8 million every year. And you can see the net payment uh, will be done by, by the US financial institution to the UK one. 
of course, it uh, changes from time to time. For example, the first year uh, is estimated that they will uh, they will pay 8.8 .8 million. They will receive 8 million. So uh, the difference is $800,000 to be made by the uh, US bank to the UK bank and so on. So uh, we have seen the interest rate swap and also currency swap and also the combination of both. We call it again circles, uh, the combined, combined swap. Now, uh, um, we'll pay attention to the credit swaps, credit default swaps, and uh, how to use this kind of contract to hedge uh, the credit risk. Right. So there are two types. Well, at first here, uh, um, Greenspan and Greenspan recognize that these swaps were prone to induce speculative excesses. This is so true because actually you can uh, participate in the this, this, this swap contracts without even having underlying situation. So you, you can simply take a, a, call it a buy or sell position, right? the uh, long or short position, without actually having an underlying situation or, uh, or underlying assets. So it has two. Uh, two type here. The first one is total return swap and the second one is pure credit swap. So total return swap, total return swap is uh, uh, a swap where uh, we swap or we exchange the whole uh, interest payments for total return to a bond or loan uh, and This is actually hedging against the uh, possible change in credit risk exposure. So total return swap, so we swap the, the, the whole like, interest payments. Uh, so not only, you know, uh, not only do we hedge the, the credit risk, but also the interest rate risk. But on the other hand, for the pure credit swap, uh, we only swap, or we, we, we only try to hedge the credit risk. So that's what we call it, pure, pure, credit, uh, pure credit swap. So we've seen an example here. Okay, so let's say uh, we are here, uh, we are a financial institution, and of course, we lend out money to our customers, uh, to our clients, and it's expected that the clients will repay their debts, so we will repay their borrowings to us. Uh, however, uh, we, you never know um, what will happen to your clients, right? Who knows your clients? Let's say uh, client A. So one of your clients is declining in uh, credit worthiness, is having a financial difficulty, maybe because of the uh, we don't know, financial crisis or a uh, certain, certain situation, maybe systematic risk, maybe uh, specific risk suffered by that uh, Client, right? so it's decreasing in in, in credit, credit worthiness. So uh, we make a contract and we make a swap contract of credit default swaps with another financial institution or you know, whatever uh, other other institutions that want to uh, uh, to deal with this to, to participate in this contract. So we make a contract that says we will pay a fixed rate fixed rate. Uh, uh, certain rate of fixed interest rate plus this is a, a, a change in credit worthiness. So for example, uh, let's say we lend out money. Right? So we lend out money to, let's say a client in, uh, in Vietnam. Right? So we lend out money to a client in Vietnam and uh, again, what are we afraid of in this situation? We're afraid of a decreasing credit worthiness of that Vietnamese client from time to time. Right? So here we can use a proxy and the common proxy will be the government bond, uh, uh, Vietnamese government bond denominated in our home currency. If we are in the United States, then 
we try to find uh, the, 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 the value, the market value of uh, Vietnamese government bond denominated in US dollar. Right, so it's similar to, uh, let's say we, uh, maybe Yankee bond, the Yankee, Yankee government bond, so, if you, so, to, so to speak. But uh, let's imagine the situation, okay? Uh, let's say the uh, value of value of the government, the Vietnamese government bond denominated in US dollar decreases. So if the value of uh, if the value of the Vietnamese government bond denominated in US dollar decreases, we could we could use this we could use this as a proxy uh, that that implies that the credit worthiness of our Vietnamese client has decreased as well. I know it's not necessarily true. Uh, this may not be entirely accurate, but this is a proxy, right? The uh, representative. So you could imagine that uh, if if the value has de declined, right? Maybe from on the scale uh, at first this is one hundred, but now it has become eighty. So you see here, from one hundred uh, <coughs> dropping to eighty then we know that this is what minus 20% right minus 20% or minus uh, 0 0.2 right? minus 0 0.2 plus the fixed rate that we we have to pay to uh, the is that the uh, seller of the credit default swaps on the other hand we will receive LIBOR right? in this example so uh, again we do this to hedge at both right, the interest rate and also uh, interest rate and also the credit risk. That's why we call it total return swap. Total return swap. So we deal with or we hedge the interest rate risk as well as the credit risk. So we see an example now. Uh, let's say the one year LIBOR is 11%. So for sure, based on the contract, we will get uh, 11%. F, uh, for, for this year because the LIBOR is 11% and we'll have to pay the fixed rate plus the here fixed rate plus so this is 12% plus um, the change in the change in the market value of Vietnamese bond denominated in or Vietnamese government bond denominated in US dollar and in this example what is happening so the uh, previous price is 100% but now uh, the Vietnamese government bond has decreased in value to 90. So it's the decrease is 10, right? So uh, if we calculate, uh, so this is a fixed rate that we have to pay, right? fixed plus the change, right? So 12% plus, so again, at, uh, at the beginning, it was 100, but now it's 90. So uh, this is what the uh, decrease by ten percent. Right? So twelve percent minus ten percent. So two percent. So we only need to pay. So we only need to pay two percent to the credit credit swap seller, but we we will receive eleven percent. So this is quite uh, profitable. And again, this profit is expected to compensate for. Uh, the declining credit worthiness of the client, right? The Vietnamese client. Okay, but again, uh, this might be excessive in, in the economy because we can go to actually we can go to the market, we can go to the contract without uh, having any underlying situation or uh, underlying asset right? because we just uh, we just simply want to make more money. We simply have an expectation or uh, a perspective or a prediction or something like that. So we go to the swaps market. We uh, we go into the contract without having any underlying assets or situations. What about the uh, pure credit swap? The pure credit swap uh, doesn't really deal with the interest rate risk. Unlike the total return swap here, we see here we we, we are exchanging you know uh, uh, interest rate 
system, right? Uh, here we have the fixed rate plus the change in uh, the value of government bond uh, that represents the credit worthiness of a client from that particular country. Uh, but here for the pure credit swap, this is very simple. We, uh, we make a contract that will pay annual fee. This is determined, uh, predetermined by the contract. We pay the annual fee and in, uh, in return, we will receive a default payment, right? default payment. So the situation is the same. We are lending money to, uh, to clients right? and we expect that those clients will repay their borrowings to us. Uh, but we are afraid or we are concerned uh, that some of our clients or maybe one particular client will, uh, will decrease, uh, will uh, deteriorate in terms of its credit worthiness. So we, we are making this uh, pure credit swap that says that we will receive uh, the default payment, right? the, the payment of payment of the interest or payment of the interest plus principal or anything uh, it, it depending on the contract and uh, on the other hand we will we'll pay the annual fee so if something happens we will receive this right uh, if nothing happens of course we don't receive any default payment but we still have to pay the, the annual fee so this is quite similar to an insurance system right? so you you keep paying uh, a, a premium or a certain amount of fee all the time but if something happens you receive the uh, uh, you receive a certain amount of money as uh, predetermined by the contract so here can you you pay the uh, annual fee to the seller of this contract but if something happens to your client, uh, what that one particular client, let's say uh, the client goes broke and uh, cannot fulfill his obligation to you, then you will get default payment from the other financial institution. So you see the difference here. Again, the previous one was uh, total return swap. Uh, so we actually exchange. So we, we try to hedge the interest rate risk as well as the credit risk. So this is the interest rate risk part and this is the credit risk, risk part and so we have the combined uh, hedging effort here. But for the pure credit swap, we only uh, pay attention or we only care about the credit risk. So we don't uh, uh, we don't really hedge the interest rate risk in this uh, system. And of course, we have a lot of uh, concerns here. Um, the financial crisis could elevate the concern because if we think about it, if we make a, a swaps contract, actually uh, both parties should should be able to hedge, you know, each other's risk right, from the interest rate interest rate uh, swap that we saw previously. We know that if uh, one entity doesn't like the fixed rate payment. Uh, it tries, it tries to find another entity who likes to pay the fixed rate payment and vice versa. The other, maybe the other entity doesn't like the uh, floating rate payment, but uh, the, the first entity actually likes to pay the uh, floating rate payment. So they could make uh, a swap or an exchange. Uh, so both parties should be quite, quite, quite safe because they have underlying, underlying uh, uh, assets or situations. However, in the complex financial market system, uh, in our financial markets, again, we can uh, make the swaps, swaps contracts, we can make swaps contracts uh, in whatever way, whichever direction we want. Maybe we, have, uh, we don't have an underlying asset or situation, but we have an expectation, or we have a certain prediction, so we go to the swap market to, to simply you know, uh, do the transaction. So uh, see, for example here, Lehman Brothers that went down in 2008. Uh, so they sold so much uh, uh, notional value of credit default swaps. 
So a lot of uh, selling of credit default swaps because they they didn't expect the financial crisis to happen. They could imagine if nothing happened at that time, they would get a lot of uh, uh, fee, right? And also uh, 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 interest rate differential. If you see this situation again, if nothing happens to the client here, nothing happens to the client, so they will receive uh, the fixed rate fixed rate payment from from uh, the buyer of the credit default swap, but they will only pay LIBOR. So they will they will have the what's that the spread right? spread income. So uh, it would be like very easy easy business to Lehman Brothers if nothing happened because they will receive again they will receive the uh, uh, interest rate differential uh, between what what they had to pay and what that they receive and there was no change in credit risk so they would they would get the uh, interest rate differential and for the pure credit swap they would receive the uh, premium or fee so it's very lucrative business but uh, unbeknownst to anyone in 2008 the, the crisis uh, did take place so Lehman Brothers couldn't fulfill certainly couldn't fulfill its obligation uh, with respect to the swaps contract so it went down right it went broke and because of that uh, I think the uh, US government has been very careful for example in 2009 uh, we start having this act of the counter derivative market act that uh, that tries to increase the transparency of the derivative contracts making right so uh, how they they uh, have to appear more on balance sheet instead of uh, uh, off balance sheet no the traditional off balance sheet system of derivative contract and uh, something like that so uh, another thing is now we have to do the netting by novation uh, especially when there are many contracts between parties so the complicated contracts between two or more parties and this often has to be formalized using the master netting agreement in the U.S. system. So uh, this being the case, and the regulator could control, uh, uh, could, could at least monitor or supervise the uh, derivative contracts uh, making and then the uh, payment obligations or something like that related to the uh, swaps contracts. And uh, uh, payment flows are basically interest and not principal, but I think the uh, previously in the, the uh, pure credit swap, we could see that uh, that could also include the principal right? in the, the pure credit swap that we saw before. But uh, because of the uh, because of the crisis, I think the regulator has been has been uh, more uh, assertive, right? has been more uh, affirmative in in. Uh, uh, implementing or enforcing the uh, cutting edge regulations, and this is this might be one of the uh, payment flows. Payment flow should be uh, interest payment instead of principal, and also uh, more and more this kind of swaps contract uh, requires standby LC, uh, standby LC or standby guarantee by a financial institution. So this. Uh, actually makes it more you know uh, more difficult uh, to execute the swaps contracts especially for entities that don't really have underlying assets or situations they simply come to the swaps uh, swaps contract to uh, you know, try to make money because of the uh, certain expectation or, or prediction Okay, so uh, I hope you enjoyed today's session. This is the uh, second part of the swaps contract uh, discussion, uh, more, uh, which is more specific on the hedging process by, by a financial institution. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in.
this video and um, hope to see you again next time in uh, another topic. Thank you.